I see some new faces out here. How many people are the first time here? Okay, so about, about half of you, cool. So how did you guys find out about us? Facebook, Facebook? okay. Any? Facebook? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, good. All right. well welcome everybody. Um, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the pond guy around here. Uh, but we have a wonderful, huge staff of uh, people that put everything together. My role today is, uh, is basically come in and just kind of teach all the stupid things that I learned over the years uh, about what not to do uh, when building a pond, what not to do when taking care of plants, what not to do when taking care of fish. And so that's kind of my role that I view it as today is, is teaching everybody all the dumb things that I did over, over the years. So um, I've been doing this for about 30 years. Uh, I give these seminars all the time, but I learn something new at every single one. So uh, hopefully you guys will too. And uh, don't hesitate, raise your hand. If you're thinking about a question, your neighbor is too, or maybe they didn't even think about it yet and, uh, and you'll help everybody out. So don't hesitate interrupt and uh, as we uh, as we go through here today um, i've always wanted to separate these two seminars as as a fish seminar and then a plant seminar but we run out of calendar because uh, we want to do them all in all in the spring and uh, i just don't have the energy to do them every single week so uh, so we uh, we put them all together um, but my goal here today is not only to talk about plants and fish but to answer your questions uh, as to you know how to get a crystal clear pond with happy healthy fish uh, and, uh, and without a lot of work. Well, let, I'm going to start, if everybody got one of these little booklets here, um, I always start off talking about our ponds and how we do them um, because plants are an integral part of our ponds um, and fish are an integral part of our ponds. Um, but before we even get to plants and fish, there's a few basics uh, that we recommend as far as construction and things like that. So I always love to get everybody kind of oriented on the same page, uh, and then we can jump into, uh, jump into all, these, uh, all these questions. Um, like I said before, I've been doing this for about 30 years, and we first started building ponds back in the late 80s. Uh, my mom's in the back row, and my dad are in the back row there. So they, they uh, allowed me to play in their, uh, in their backyard. So the first pond I ever built was in the late 80s at, uh, at their house, and we did not have a skimmer. You know, the first pond we built there had a pump on the very bottom of the pond. And uh, so it was a high maintenance type thing. You'd have to scuba dive down to the bottom of the pond, unclog the pump, get all the muck and debris, you know, off the pond. Skimmers just weren't around then. Um, so it was about the mid 90s, 94, 95, that the pond skimmer uh, became available. Um, a friend of mine out in uh, Chicago, Greg Whitstock, started a company called Aquascape. Uh, how many people have heard of Aquascape here? Okay, so a little, uh, so a, few, a few of you. Um, Aquascape today is the largest manufacturer of pond equipment in the world. Uh, we think they're one of the most innovative companies. We've uh, been doing business with them since uh, 94. Um, and just a great company, and they continue to innovate. There's other companies out there manufacturing uh, skimmers, but we, uh, we sell the, uh, the Aquascape skimmer. We think that's the, uh, probably the best skimmer out there on the market as far as the features and, uh, and ease of installation and things like that. But uh, the role of the skimmer allows us to move the pump from the bottom of the pond into the skimmer. So similar to how a swimming pool works, uh, that if you get a leaf on one corner of the pond, that skimmer should be powerful enough to pull um, that leaf off, that, off the surface of the pond and into the skimmer basket before it drops to the bottom of the pond. So it's not only leaves, it's twigs, it's sticks, it's solids in the fish waste, um, it's pollen. You know, so the past couple of weeks, I mean, you go out to your car, it has an inch of pollen on it. Well, guess what? Those nutrients are getting into your pond. So, you know, you don't really see it, it's microscopic, but it adds a huge load uh, to the pond. If we don't get it out of the pond, your pond has to deal with all of these excess nutrients. And we'll talk about what happens to those nutrients in a second. Um, but the role of the skimmer, if it's doing its job, 90% of all the debris that gets in the pond gets sucked off the surface before it drops down to the bottom of the pond. So 90% of it. So we could say that that's 90% of filtering the pond is the skimmer. If you don't have a skimmer on your pond, the skimmer is going to solve a lot of problems for you. Um, and uh, it can be easily retrofitted. If you have a rubber liner pond, you can install a skimmer, you know, that way. Uh, perhaps you have a skimmer and it's just not powerful enough. If you, you know, I always do that test. I throw a leaf on that side of the pond and if the uh, uh, leaf kind of just hangs out in the middle or never really makes it to the skimmer, well, we need to put a bigger pump in your skimmer to be more powerful to pull it in there. Uh, our skimmers have these little weird doors, so it creates a very high efficiency, very high flow rate across the surface of the water. So there's ways that you can improve the efficiency of, of your skimmer. So, so, but just do that test um, and make sure that that's working. Yes. Yep. Is that where the filter is too? 
Yeah, so this is, uh, we have two types of filtration on the pond. The skimmer is the very first type. We call that physical filtration. So that's physically getting all that debris out of the pond. Um, and that's where your maintenance is going to be too. So your maintenance is uh, every once in a while, once a week, you know, just reach in that skimmer, empty the basket out, dump the debris, rehang that basket. Um, your pump will never clog because it's sitting down in the bottom of that uh, the skimmer. Um, but you can keep that skimmer as clean as you want. If you're a bad pond owner like me, you <laughs> empty your skimmer every three months. Um, if, uh, if you're very meticulous, you know, every time you get a leaf in there, it's like, oh my gosh, got to put my coffee down and run out with tweezers and grab that leaf. Um, you know, but the skimmer is step one. In, uh, in, filtering, uh, in filtering the pond. Um, so physically f getting all of that debris off the surface uh, out, out of the water before it has a chance to interact with it. That's kind of the role of the, uh, of the skimmer. Um, and we have different size skimmers for different ponds. Anybody ever see the uh, pond at Leg Up Farm? Okay, a few, a few people. So we built that pond, uh, designed it. Um, it's, uh, it's a little over a third of an acre, between a third and a half an acre. Um, that pond has skimming filtration on it. Now, if you see our skimmers on our ponds here, those plastic units, we would have to line up like 30 of those on that pond to do it. So we actually custom built a skimmer. So we can custom build skimming filtration into acre sized lakes uh, if we need to. Um, we're building a pond, uh, everybody see the new hospital that's being built out here, uh, the new Memorial Hospital. Uh, we're building a 100 foot long pond right outside the emergency room, right outside the main entrance of the hospital. Um, that is gonna have skimming filtration on it. It's gonna be a little, it's custom built and kind of hidden because um, we're skimming a hundred feet away, you know, so we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, some uh, supplemental uh, design details on, on that one, but, uh, uh, but the idea is the same. We want it to skim that surface so that way all that debris gets out of the pond because that pond is going to be open to the public basically 24 seven and it just needs to look beautiful. And, uh, and so that's the step one is to skim that pond as, 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 uh, as uh, best we can, you know, that way. So we talked about physical filtration. We talked about that being like 90% of the battle. Um, the second part of filtering the pond is on the other side over here, if you see that biofilter. Um, and so the biofilter is, um, is kind of the magic that happens in the pond. That's the nature of the pond. You know, so uh, if we're physically removing all of the debris, there's still about 10% of the debris, fish waste, um, some organics that are getting to the bottom of the pond, things like that. As they break down, they emit ammonia. If, uh, if the fish were just left to swim around in that ammonia, they wouldn't be very happy. And in fact, they wouldn't survive very long. Um, so the very first thing that we do in biofiltration is, uh, in, is we put in some what's called beneficial bacteria. It's a good bacteria that uh, goes and it colonizes on every nook and cranny throughout their pond. So if you notice, our ponds have rock and gravel on them. And, uh, and down in the filters themselves, we have these filter mats. And then we have bio balls or lava rock or... I don't know, I've seen bio ribbon, bio, any kind of you know, nook and cranny um, that you can get to grow beneficial bacteria. Uh, a friend of mine did a study a number of years ago uh, using, uh, trying to figure out what material grew the best beneficial bacteria. And what he determined was those little pot scrubbies from the dollar store grow bacteria better than anything else in the world. So kind of makes you think about doing dishes. But, um, but this, is a, uh, this is a good bacteria. Um, and what we wanted to do is to colonize everywhere in the pond, colonize on all these filter mats, colonize on the bio balls, uh, colonize in the lava rock. Um, and the more bacteria we can grow, the more fish waste, the more ammonia that we can process. Um, so you were asking, how many fish can I have in my 10 by 10 pond or my 50 by 50 pond? The size of the pond is not as relevant as the size of the biofilter. So the more beneficial bacteria you can grow, the more fish wastes or ammonia that you can process. So, you know, if you have a huge biological filter on a tiny pond, you can have a huge amount of fish. If you have zero biological filtration on a big pond, you're reduced with the amount of fish. So it's not the actual size of the pond that matters. It's the size of, and the efficiency of your biofilter um, and, uh, and, and how much bacteria you can grow. Um, so the idea in our biofilters, if you go and you look at them, um, there's a swirl chamber on the bottom, and then there's some filter mats, um, and, uh, and then on top of that is either lava rock or bio balls or something like that. Um, so this bacteria, you put uh, just a couple of squirts. These are great pump top bottles. So if you have a thousand gallons, uh, you'd put 10 pumps of this in once a week, and uh, you just put it in the skimmer. It gets pushed up in the biofilter, and then the bacteria goes to work. It's just sitting up there waiting for that ammonia to come in. As the ammonia come in, comes in, it converts that ammonia into nitrites. Um, so, uh, so the science lesson starts here. So the ammonia gets converted into nitrites with beneficial bacteria. 
if the cycle stopped right there, how many people have been to Europe and seen any water gardens in Europe? So a couple, a couple people are, how green are they? I tell everybody they're green, right? So, um, so European ponds are traditionally green. Europe has been doing ponds a lot longer, longer than the United States has existed. Um, there's ponds that date back to the Roman times. Uh, I just read an article the other day, there's a 3,500 year old pond in Turkey, you know, that they actually raised decorative fish in and uh, things like that. So 3,500 years ago, they've been, uh, they've been doing it. I've only been doing it for 30. So um, they probably know a little bit more about it than I do. Um, but the difference, a major difference between American ponds and European ponds is um, Europeans are happy with green water. They don't care. Um, the fish are happy because we got rid of the ammonia. Um, but, the, if the, but in the European ponds, the filters are a little bit smaller. And so they have enough filtration to get rid of the ammonia and convert to nitrites. Their cycle kind of stops right there. High nitrites grows green water algae. And so, and so if you ever see a pond that is green water, that if you stick your hand into it, your hand kind of just disappears. Um, you know, and, and the fish are swimming around. The fish don't really care. The fish actually like it a little bit because it provides a little bit of cover for them and things like that. But it's us crazy Americans that want crystal clear water and we want to be able to see these expensive fish that we buy. You know, so, um, so the uh, um, reason that you have green water, regardless of whether it's an acre sized lake or a 10 by 10 pond, the reason you have green water is because of high nitrites. Um, and uh, if you bring your water into test and say, hey, Mark says I have high nitrites, guess what? It's going to read zero nitrites or low nitrites. The reason is the green water algae is eating up all those nitrites. So, so you know, the, uh, um, so the nitrites are going to go away one way or the other. You're either going to let bacteria eat the nitrites or you're going to let single cell algae eat the nitrites. Um, in our ponds, we set them up so the bacteria eats it uh, and consumes all of those nitrites so there's none left for green water. So if you look at our ponds, crystal clear to the bottom, um, you know, the, and the fish are super happy. Well, the fish are happy because we got rid of the ammonia. The water is clear because we fed the nitrites to beneficial bacteria. That's it. There's no algicides in our pond. There's no UV sterilizers in our ponds. Um, and those two things do work. You know, they'll kill alg single cell algae, but what they don't do is help balance the whole pond out. They don't get rid of the nitrites. You know, they just basically kill the algae. And now all of a sudden you have dead algae in your pond. And guess what? Dead algae becomes nutrients for next week's algae. And so next week you come in with a bigger bottle of algicide and next week a bigger bottle of algicide um, to try to kill all this algae. But this algae keeps building up and building up and building up. What we like to do in our ponds and, and the secret to our clarity in our, in our ponds is grow as much beneficial bacteria as we can. So we starve the algae instead of killing it. Does that make sense? So, so the solution to your green water is how do we grow more beneficial bacteria? Um, and so it might be just the physical size of the biofilter just needs to be bigger. Um, maybe you just need to put one on, you know, you don't have one at all. You do, yeah. Um, and, then, and then the other thing is look at it and see if there's more space inside there to pack more bioballs or lava rock or more filter pads. If water can kind of escape around the side of the filters, well, you're not getting filtration. It's just bypassing it. Um, if it can sneak around the side of the bio balls, you know, if there's more physical room in that filter to put more bio balls and more lava rock, do it. You know, because the more physical space you have to grow bacteria, the more bacteria you can grow. You know, so that's that's kind of how we do crystal clear water. So, so in ours, you know, the filters go right to the sidewall, super, super tight. You know, in over two or three years, those filters start to shrink a little bit and then the water is going to sneak around. So it becomes a little bit less effective. So that's why it's important to replace those filter pads you know, every two to three years. So just take a look at them. Our bio balls don't need to be replaced. I mean, they, they last forever. Um, and if you'd ever look down on that bio filter, you're going to see it looks brown and mucky and gross. That's a good thing. I call that, some people call it gross. I call it biofilm. You know, so it's beneficial bacteria that's living in there. Um, if you ever want your pond to turn green, go ahead and clean out your biofilter. You know, as soon as you clean out that biofilter, you're gonna kill off that bacteria that's doing a job of cleaning the pond. Are you guilty of that? Yeah, you had a guilty look on your face, yeah. Um, but everybody does it. So, you know, so, you know, we sell our pond kits in here and, and people go home and, they're, and they build their own pond and, and they said, it looks great. And then like a week later, they're like, Mark, this is the worst thing you ever sold. You know, the pond is pea soup green. And then it's just a matter of a couple minutes till I figure out which one of the couple is cleaning the biofilter because that's the problem. You know, so if you clean that biofilter, you're killing off all the good bacteria that's doing the job of cleaning your pond. Um, so in our ponds, clean the skimmer as often as you want. Don't touch the bio. 
leave the bio alone. Um, so the, um, the muckiness that you see in there is not organic debris. It's actually just live culture bacteria doing its thing and it doesn't clog the filter. You know, is this, you know, this is where we're, we're getting rid of all the physical debris. On your biofilter, that's just water can freely f flow through that, through that biofilter um, you know, with all that bacteria on there. But, uh, but so physically cleaning it here and biologically changing it there. Do they float? Uh, no, and that's you know that's one of the th things I because I, we sell both. We'll do lava rock and some ponds and bio balls and others. Um, as far as the amount of beneficial bacteria can grow, it's about the same. Bio balls wins out a little bit. They grow a little bit more bacteria, um, and I think that's why it's more popular um, because they grow a little bit more bacteria. But we have ponds that we built 15, 20, 30 years ago that are still using the same lava rock. You know, so lava rock does work. Um, it's just not as effective as the bio ball. So either one would work, you can use but both? you can use both. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you have bio balls in there, you're like, oh, I need more, you know, more filter media in there and you don't have bio balls on hand, grab a bag of lava rock, you know, and, uh, and mix that, mix that in there. That's fine. Uh, but the key is just as much surface area as you can get in there to grow as much bacteria. Uh, yeah, all of our biofilters are open, and thank you for that great segue. Um, and if you notice, the uh, top of them has plants on there. And so we're going to jump into why those plants are there. But the, uh, but the intro to that is what happens after the bacteria converts from ammonia to nitrites? What happens to those nitrites? They get eaten up by the bacteria. And then the byproduct of that is nitrates. Nitrates is fertilizer for all of these plants. So if you go to Lowe's and buy a fertilizer for your lawn, one of the ingredients there is nitrates. Um, so all of these plants eat up the nitrates, and we'll get into that in, um, in, just, a, in just a little bit. But that's how our filters are designed, um, to be hidden in the ground. Uh, they disappear, uh, and, uh, and then they're softened up with the plants on the top. So um, it goes ammonia, nitrites, nitrates. And that's the whole science lesson. So it um, doesn't matter what you know, size or shape it is. Um, back to the leg up farm pond, our biofilter on that pond is 30 feet by 50 feet. So bigger than this tent. Um, wow. Our biofilter on our, on our large pond here is uh, 10 feet by six feet. Our medium pond, we're actually using a biofilter, a plastic biofilter unit. Uh, it's a little bit smaller. And then our small pond, we use a smaller one. So the bigger the pond, the more fish that we want to raise in there, the bigger that biofilter needs to be. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Awesome. So, um, so that's kind of the, the orientation that we have. So if you don't have a skimmer, and, and you, you know, hey, we're not going to get one this year. Just keep in mind, you're the skimmer. You know, you physically getting in there and getting as much debris out of that pond as possible. You know, taking a leaf net to the bottom and, and grabbing that muck, you know, out of the bottom of that. Um, we rent pond vacs, you know, so some people will go in and just vacuum the bottom of the pond, just getting, getting that debris out of there. Um, another awesome uh, uh, tool that you can have in your arsenal is sludge cleaner. This is a, another type of bacteria, but this is an anaerobic bacteria. It goes to the bottom and eats away that organic sludge um, and uh, converts it into basically oxygen and water. And uh, so, so this, is a, this is a great help. Um, even if you do have a skimmer, you know, customers love this as a little, a little polish just to help with that other 10% of that debris that the skimmer's not getting, you know, that way. So, um, so beneficial bacteria is your friend, biofilter, and then the sludge cleaner, yeah. So will that break down leaves then? Um, eventually, yes, yeah, yeah. It's not, as, it's not as efficient as the skimmer, you know, because the skimmer's getting it out first. Um, but if you have a little bit down in there on the bottom, this is awesome stuff. Yep. So cool. All right. So those are the, those are the two things to kind of keep in mind as we, uh, as we uh, look, at, look at the ponds and try and evaluate, you know, why they're green. Um, talk about why they're brown here. Brown water could be caused by just excess debris on the bottom of the pond. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, so, so normally in your situation, if it hasn't been cleaned in a while, um, then it's time to just clean it you know just to set up a tent well you don't even have any fish but if you would have fish our typical procedure for cleaning a pond is we'll, we'll put a temporary tank next to the pond we'll pump about um, a third of the water into temporary tanks and save it uh, move the fish into there and then we just drain the pond the rest of the way down um, and uh, and then we're just getting in there with buckets and just bucket it all out you know the uh, uh, all the muck and uh, muck and debris our ponds are designed to look natural but they're not. It's a closed ecosystem. So we try to mimic nature as much as possible. Um, and in nature, the snow you know, lands on the mountains and in the springtime it fills the rivers and it's just a torrent and it just washes all that stuff away. 
And so we mimic that here in our, in our, in our ponds uh, by doing a clean out. You know, and especially in your situation, that would be the best thing, the best thing for you um, is to um, just get all of that muck and debris out of the pond. The reason that we save a third of the water and sometimes even more is because we don't want to destroy the entire ecosystem. We want to save that good water. Your fish are used to swimming around in that water, so they're used to all the parameters that that water has, the pH, the temperature, everything, uh, the water chemistry. So we want to not shock the fish too much. Um, even, you know, 50% uh, water change is pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, I was just at a pond the other day, a customer of ours um, that we maintain, and we did, we did a, a, a freshening, we did a, a clean out for them, and uh, they called me and said, Mark, the water's brown. And I go out and uh, the landscapers had been out this week and, uh, and freshly mulched the whole way around the pond with the, with the dyed mulch. And so we got a little bit of rain and so that a little bit of that dye washed into the pond. Um, so, so that's something that you see brown water sometimes too. Um, you can either wait and let it dissipate, you know, with the next rainfall and eventually it'll go away. Or you can use, we have an activated carbon, you know, that can actually pull those tannins, uh, tannic color out of, out of the water, you know, that way. So, um, but that's, uh, you know, that's green water, brown water. Anybody have any other color water? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep, so, so typically on our ecosystem ponds that have skimmers that are doing a great job and the biofoil is doing a great job, uh, at least every three years as a minimum, we have some customers who their ponds are in a, a leafy situation, a wooded situation. We have customers that the, the pond is neglected come you know, November 1st, they forget the pond is there and they don't go back to it till April 1st and it's like, ugh. You know? So in those situations there, we do them every year. But I would recommend just once a year at most. Um, if your skimmer's doing a great job, you don't need it more than that. Um, and you could, I mean, we have customers that have had their pond for 10 years and have never done a clean out. I think that's really pushing it because um, they're very meticulous. If they get a leaf in there, they're out there with the, you know, their tweezers, you know, it's that type of thing. So they're very meticulous about the pond. And if you look at the pond, it looks fantastic. But I would still recommend doing a flush, you know, of that system. You know, in that situation, maybe take it to five years. But pushing it to 10 years, this is the best system out there, skimmer biofalls type set, setup. Um, but it's not nature, you know, so, so th there's stuff building up in there that you do just want to give, give a flush out every once in a while. So, so the answer to your question, some people do it every year. Um, I would say the majority of our customers are at least once or twice every three years. So, yeah, cool. Any other questions on that basic setup that way? So cool. Okay, awesome. So, um, so we do all of this to keep the fish happy. Um, and, uh, and, and, to keep the, and to keep the water, uh, water crystal clear. The byproduct of that is nutrients for all these plants. And we're gonna jump into these in a second. But I did want to, our, our seminar is titled Fish and Plants. So let's, let's chat a little bit about, uh, about fish. This time of year, the fish are just coming out of their state. It's called torpor. So it's kind of like hibernation, but not quite. Anybody ever heard that word before? You have, whoa. How have you heard that word? <laughs> but fish in the winter time, they don't technically go into hibernation. They go into a state of torpor, which is close to hibernation. Um, and they go down, they're still living and breathing. They're still exhaling, uh, if, if you will. And so we have to get those bad gases, you know, out of the pond. And so for the winter time, we recommend aeration, you know, whether it's with a waterfall or, um, or an aerator that sits on the bottom of the pond and it just blows the air bubbles up to the surface, breaks the surface, and that gets the bad gases out. Um, but they're not eating. You know, so they stop eating uh, when the water temperature drops below about 55 degrees. Uh, and then in the springtime, uh, 55 degrees is the magic temperature again, where they're like, all right, it's springtime, I'm hungry, you know, let's start eating. And so we start off our fish in the springtime on an on a easy to digest food uh, that um, uh, can, you know, they start to get accustomed to eating again, but this food doesn't sit in their systems for very long. You know, it, uh, they, they use it up um, in that. The problem with that, early spring temperature, if, if you give them a, a food that would sit in their, in their gut for a while, it could cause uh, uh, infections and, and things like that. So, so we want to just slowly ease them into, uh, ease in, into, the, uh, into the food cycle that way. Um, the food that I love to get our fish started on um, is this, uh, it's manufactured by Blue Ridge uh, Fish Hatchery down in uh, the Carolinas. Uh, it's a probiotic food. Um, coming out of winter, not only are the fish dormant, uh, everything else in the pond is dormant too. So everything li likes to attack them is, uh, is dormant. Um, the plants are dormant, everything's dormant. And so what we wanna do is build up their immune systems as quickly as possible so that way they 
are ready to fight you know, any of these infections or anything like that, that that could get in the pond. And so our probiotic food helps them do just that. So, so I love getting them started with, uh, with this. Um, I also brought out koi crunchies. Koi crunchies uh, is a great way to uh, teach your fish how to eat out of your hand. You know, so you just hold it out there and, and uh, you can get them to bite right out, right out of your hand. So it's awesome that way. But they're also high in vitamin C. So it's another tool that you can help uh, build up their immune systems. And this is an easy to digest uh, treat you know, for them as well. So, um, so usually I like starting off the season uh, with this probiotic food and then uh, uh, supplement with a little bit of uh, koi crunchies is great. Um, other things like oranges and watermelon and things like that are, are good treats for them, but they have some nutritious value you know, as well. Once we get into summer, more that uh, June, July timeframe, um, then switch over to what I call a high growth food um, or our color enhancing foods. Foods that are a little bit higher in protein, give them some body weight and get some, some growth, uh, but also enhance the colors, really push out those reds and those whites uh, and really make the colors a little bit more, uh, more brilliant that way. So just like, just like us, if we walk down through the mall, you know, there's diseases everywhere. You know, like don't lick the handle, door handle, you know, uh, right? You know, but in your pond, these diseases exist too. You know, they're there all the time. You know, there's a, there's a lot of bacteria and, and a lot of different things that are there. Um, if your fish are in, in, in a place in their lives where they're just happy and healthy and, and, and vigorous, um, they're able to fight these things off. Um, if the water conditions in your pond get unhealthy, you know, like your uh, pH levels start to go crazy or your nitrites and nitrate levels go crazy or, or anything like that, all of a sudden, or there's not enough oxygen, all of a sudden now your fish are not happy. They're sad, they're struggling, and they're more susceptible to these things. So anytime anybody comes in with a fish health issue, like, I don't know what's happening with my fish, it's got gill issues, or it's got this fungusy thing growing on it. Um, the first thing that we always talk about is water quality. You know, what's happening with the pond? Are you aerating the pond enough? Are you skimming the pond enough? Are you doing your beneficial bacteria? You know, because those are the things that are the natural cycles that create an environment to keep the fish happy. So that's the very first thing that we always talk about is let's keep the water, make the water as happy as we can for the fish. And then, all right, let's help them fight the battle. Um, and one thing, the most natural thing we can do is probiotic foods, help them fight their own battles from the inside out. Um, and then when we start, all right, that's all well and good, but this is more of an emergency situation. You know, I need to, need to make this happen a little bit faster. They're not able to fight it off as well on, the, on themselves. My first tool is salt, pond salt. Um, so fish love, uh, you know, this salt, it helps their slime coat. Um, but if you look at it, salt actually cures about 90% of all the major things that can happen to your fish. Um, and uh, so when we uh, are, uh, are quarantining our, our fish before they go for sale, uh, you know, we're using salt. We're bringing it up to a 0.3% solution. And uh, I mean, we get our fish from very reputable sources, but in 30 years, we've never infected anybody's pond with, uh, you know, with a virus or, or bacterial infection or anything like that. Um, there's other places you can go um, that you can pick up a fish in the store today that was in the Philippines yesterday. You have no idea what kind of craziness you're gonna put in your pond. Um, we always find out eventually when this happens um, because we'll sell out of a certain type of medication, you know, and uh, because everybody went to that store and, uh, and I won't mention any names, but there's some you know, places around. Um, but you should always buy your fish here. Right? Um, if you're ever tempted to buy your fish somewhere else, rule, rule number one, buy your fish here. <laughs> All right. Seriously, if you ever see fish elsewhere and you're like, man, I want that fish and I want it now, um, ask where you're getting it from, what their quarantine procedure is. Um, try to gauge their comfort level with that question. <laughs> um, if they look at you like a blank stare, you walk away. You don't want to be putting a, a, a disease in your pond. Um, there's diseases out there, and I was just reading a, a thread on, the, on a, a private f uh, professional forum just this week, just yesterday, I think. Um, KHV, which is koi herpes virus, is rearing its ugly head again. Um, if you get KHV in your pond, your fish will be wiped out in two days, every single one of your fish. Um, it's just something that there's no, uh, they're working on cures. University of Georgia is working on cures. Um, uh, University of California uh, working on some uh, research and things like that in it. But there's some diseases out there that will wipe your fish out like that. And it's in the hobby. I mean, there's, there's professional places that sell fish um, that are passing this disease on and they're just moving fish as fast as possible and they never, um, um, 
they, they never check for that kind of stuff. So, so rest assured, you get your fish from here. We've gone through all kinds of procedures to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, and we're not passing that kind of stuff on. So, so be very careful with that. Yeah. Now, how often should you be testing your water? Um, we do, and, uh, and they, they will do it for you in there. Um, we'll test pH, we'll test nitrites, you know, all these different, all these different levels. Um, in 30 years of owning a pond, I've never professionally tested a customer's pond with a functioning ecosystem. Um, it's not necessary. In my opinion, if everybody's happy and healthy, then let it go. Let nature do its thing. Um, we do have some customers who love to test their water. They love to test it at night. And if you take your pH, yeah, if you take your pH reading in the morning, you're going to get a certain reading. You take it at night, you're going to get a certain reading. Um, but the day that you start trying to micromanage that, all of a sudden that pond's not relaxing and low maintenance anymore. You're dumping pH up in in the morning, you're dumping pH down in, um, you're doing all kinds of things. We find that it's much easier to let nature take care of it for you. Um, that being said, we test our tanks probably at least once a day, right? You would know, you don't know. Um, I think we test it once a day, we might even test it twice a day. Our, our tanks in there, there's some days where we have five fish in there and then the next day we have 500. So, you know, so we're not having a balanced ecosystem in our tanks. We tried it, uh, we try it, you know, but, uh, but it's not. So we have to micromanage those tanks a little bit better. Our ponds, on the other hand, they're closed systems, they're functioning, we just let it go. The more you tinker with it, the more it becomes your headache instead of letting nature take care of it. So, so I don't, professionally, I don't recommend if you have a functioning ecosystem pond to worry about testing on a regular basis. I, d I just don't, yeah, so. Um, but that's me, I'm just relaxed, so. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, um, so to answer your question, um, salt is definitely a, a big, uh, a big component. Step one. And then once we get on that, there's some specific, you know, uh, silver bullet remedies that we have for different specific things. So, but the other thing when you're treating individual fish is I don't recommend pulling a sick fish out and just putting him by himself. He'll be sad. You know, you, you laugh, but, but he'll be sad if you put him with buddies, you know, two healthy buddies with a sick fish, he'll heal a lot better. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, we've seen it in action many, many times. So, uh, yeah, so it's something to, something to think about, you know, that way. So cool. All right. So predators, um, heron, bald eagles, um, all kinds of birds and, and, uh, mink. Anybody ever seen a mink? Yeah. Mink are around everywhere. Um, so we built a pond for the people who own, uh, own uh, oats, potato chips. This is going back about 15 years. We built a nice, nice house and built these huge ponds, the smallest of which is about the size of our tent. And it's designed to make it look like all these are interconnected. But a huge collection of gorgeous Japanese koi and uh, just painstakingly picked. So we had different varieties and things like that. I go out the next year and they said, hey, Mark, all the fish are gone. It's like, no, they're not gone. Come on. You know, that we remember we built all this fish. Like we built literally fish caves underneath there. The fish can hide in in the wintertime, um, you know, underneath these stepping stones that were kind of floating a little bit in the pond. So these stones were, you know, bigger than this. There were six foot round, you know, stones and there's all kinds of them in there. I said, no, they're underneath the stones. And so I'm talking, talking, talking. And I get out there and I grab a fish net and I'm poking underneath each one of the fish caves. And there's no fish in this pond at all. None. And uh, finally, the farmer was, uh, was, uh, came over from next door. He goes, you guys see that mink over here? It's like, mink? I never even thought of it. You know, and then that was really the first exposure I had to mink, you know, really wiping it out. But since then, I've uh, educated myself on, on a mink. Um, and it turns out they're in all 67 counties in PA. Um, they're here year round. Um, if they see your pond and they're hungry, they're going to clean out your pond in about two or three hours. They'll go in, they'll swim in there, grab a fish, take it back to the den, come back, grab a fish, take, put it back to the den. In about two or three hours, they will get every last fish in there down to the tiniest fish. And um, so every, every winter, um, it seems it's, it's more common in the wintertime. Uh, we get calls from a certain neighborhood and uh, it's like, hey, this is Mrs. Smith. Somebody came and stole my fish. I'm going to call the police. And uh, I was like, I have to talk her off the ledge a little bit. I said, well, I said, you know, criminals are pretty stupid and they probably don't even know the value of your fish. And they don't have the patience to catch your fish. If you've ever tried to catch them, I said, it was probably a mink. And sure enough, you know, the next, next door neighbor, you know, neighbor two horses tells us down, you know, we get the calls. And so we get, if we put it on a map, we could track the mink, you know, going like, you know, like that. Um, the thing about mink though, they're transitory. So once they hit your pond, it's not like a heron who has a great memory. The heron's going to come back every, every, all the time. The mink just keeps on moving, you know, um, and that unfortunately there's nothing you can do for a mink. Um, there's professional trappers out there that have licenses for them. 
uh, and even uh, even with those guys, uh, it's hit or miss. You know, we've uh, uh, we've had to hire make trappers in certain situations, and we've had some success, but not enough to uh, to recommend it. You know, it's uh, it's just you know what can you do? Um, bald eagles, another issue. You know, if a bald eagle comes in and dives down and grab a fish. None of our remedies I'm going to talk about now are going to work on the bald eagle. Um, we did uh, put this telephone pole back here behind me. If we do need to stretch cables from that pole to the building, um, that would be the only thing that we could do to prevent the uh, bald eagle from coming in. Um, we've done that in certain situations. We've got a couple uh, beautiful ponds overlook the river over in Lomont neighborhood over there. And uh, you know, a couple guys over there has these huge koi collections and the bald eagle every day would come in and grab a fish and, uh, and go and uh, talk, you know, I'd like to see a video of it, you know, yeah. but, uh, uh, but it's a sad story, but we ended up doing a cabling system above this pond and uh, that, stopped the, uh, that stopped it, you know, that way. But, uh, so let's talk about what we can stop and it's heron. You know, uh, they're the most prevalent. Um, anybody know what this device is? Anybody have one? Yep, so um, this is, yep, it's a water squirter. Um, we call it a scarecrow. What it is, it's a, a um, your garden hose connects into here. You put a nine volt battery in the bottom of it. Um, and this is a motion sensor here. So the motion sensor clicks on when it senses motion, and then it sends out a sharp stream of water. It hits the bird. The bird can't figure out what's happening. So he flies up to the corner of your roof. He looks hungrily at your pond. He's like, all right, what just happened? He comes back down to the pond. He gets zapped again with a sharp stream of water. Does that two or three times, he eventually gives up. Um, so it's, we found it being very, very effective um, against, uh, against the heron. Won't work against you know, a mink, and it won't work against the bald eagle. Um, but, uh, uh, but a heron, very, very effective. Um, some people don't have access to a garden hose. Um, and then the other issue is you have to winterize this, you know, so it doesn't work in the wintertime. So you're gonna laugh at this next one, but a floating alligator. Um, heron do know what a floating alligator is. And uh, so you put this in the pond, you weight it down, see if it's got a little uh, fishing line that you weight it down there. It'll float in the pond. A heron's not gonna get close enough to see if it's real or not. And all the heron around here do migrate. So, so they've all they've all seen them, yeah, yeah. They, they've they've seen them, and uh, you know they're they're kind of freaking out a little bit. I thought I could go to Pennsylvania to get away from them, but, um, but yeah. So, so, so we found it to be it's very pretty pretty effective um, that way. Um, another thing that's effective that we don't sell um, that we probably should is rubber snakes. You know, just a, just a rubber snake laying on a rock. You know, next to there. Um, I guess it would have to be a decent sized one, and you know, and uh, and that. But uh, but that we've heard people say that that that's effective. Um, as well. So the device I don't have out here is our number one seller. It's a heron decoy. It's that fake heron that you put next to the pond. They don't work, but it's our number one seller. Um, so I, people like the way they look. Um, I mean, I, I could go through pictures and pictures uh, of, of just a fake heron standing next to a real heron. Um, fake owls people have done and the owl's head moves or whatever, you know, that way. Um, standing next to a real heron. You know, or two real herons and a fake heron in the middle. I mean, I, I, I've got a hundred pictures of that. They just don't work. The, the theory behind it is they're territorial. You know, that if this heron's here, the fake heron's here, the real heron's like, oh, I'll let him have his pond and I'll go find my other pond. It doesn't work that way in nature. I mean, it's, if he's hungry enough, yeah, if he's hungry enough, he's gonna come in, you know, and, uh, and that, um, I mean, ours moves a little bit in the wind. And so, you know, and then we have customers that, that buy it and then it's like, yeah, it worked. And it's, until it didn't, you know, yeah. so, um, so I, I can't recommend it, um, but you know, it is, it is a, it is a popular, popular item that, uh, that people try. So yeah. How about the fishing line mm -hmm. around your pond? Okay. So, out? yeah. So I actually have a, uh, the question was about putting fishing line around, around the perimeter of the pond. Um, on our YouTube channel is a, uh, is a video. Uh, it's a wildlife cam of a heron landing next to the pond. And then he starts walking into the pond. He encounters the fishing line. He steps over it. <laughs> grabs the fish and doesn't even turn around and look down he just walks backwards lifts his leg back over it and goes out so i am convinced that that's not effective either yeah yeah um so, yes yeah right um some people actually keep a net over their ponds um i the worst thing i've seen there is actually a heron come in try to chew through the net or rip through the net uh, grab a fish and then you know I've seen him fly away with a net around his around his ankles oh, wow. he gets stuck in a tree so the fish dies the bird dies and you have a net hanging up in the tree you know so um, so I, I'm not a fan of that approach either but we do have a number of customers that that's the only thing that works and so if fish are happy um, they want to make babies you know so um, I found if you have all goldfish in there 
um, and you have an e ecosystem pond and you've got plants down in there, um, you sh you'll should notice that the goldfish will just do their thing and they lay 100,000 eggs and out of 100,000 eggs, you'll get five, 10 babies you know, out of it. Um, that's a very typical experience. And then in five years, you're like, I gotta get rid of these fish. And I'm like, no, you just have to make your pond bigger. You know? um, but um, but the, uh, um, the, the natural you know, sequence of things, if there's an environmental change, you know, going from cold weather to, to warm weather, um, it'll induce them to spawn. You know, so so that's uh, that's something that we find um, in my personal pond. I mean, just in the past month, there, there was probably two or three different spawnings that happened um, in there. Um, out of the spawnings in my pond, probably and it, it happens probably four or five times a year in my pond at, at home. Um, probably every two years, I notice two or three babies. Um, what happens is that they eat their own eggs. You know, so so the, yeah, yep. If you have if you have all goldfish you'll get goldfish babies. If you have goldfish and koi mix, um, it's very rare to get any koi babies. Um, it's just the, uh, just the, it's a numbers game. You know, the goldfish and everybody will eat the, eat the eggs um, that way. In my personal pond, I wanted just all koi. So I have a little bit of a hope of getting, getting koi babies through there. Um, there's things that you can do um, having habitat, you know, uh, parrot's feather is an awesome habitat plant. You know, the eggs can get in there and, and kind of uh, get stuck on an undersurface that way. Um, bog bean is another one that's an awesome uh, habitat you know, uh, uh, plant you know, that way. So, um, so having these nooks and crannies in the pond. Um, you know, in, in my personal pond, I've got some little beach areas that are very heavily planted, similar to how we have that here um, with, the, uh, uh, with the plant right on, the, right on the beach there. Plenty of nooks and crannies and about water that deep right at the edge near the skimmer that the eggs can kind of get hidden into that the fish can't go and get them. So yeah, usually it's usually it's in the spring, and usually it's an environmental change, such as going from winter into spring. Um, a lot of customers re report that when they take a fish from our tanks here and take it home, within two or three weeks they get babies um, because it's it's an environmental change for that fish. It's something that's stressful. It's like okay, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know spawn at this point. You know, so um, so those those types of things. You know, would uh, if you keep your pond too clean like there's no nooks and crannies for the eggs, you know, then every time you get an egg in there, the fish are like, all right, that's not supposed to be here. And, and, they, and they get it, um, you know, so those are, those are kind of some, some factors. Um, a tiny pond is gonna be less likely to produce, you know, um, more eggs than, than a larger pond, but it's nature, anything can happen in there, so. And Barry Manilow, who knows? Yeah. So, so we talked a little bit about winterization um, and what happens in the winter time. Um, we sell a lot of pond heaters. Um, I recommend aeration over, over a heater or in addition to. Um, just a heater by itself doesn't disturb the water surface. And so um, when you put an aerator in or run a waterfall, you're getting disturbance of the water surface. And so that gets the gases out. You know, water particles tend to like want to stick together. And, um, and so if there's nothing physically trying to move them apart to get the gases out, the gases can stick in there even with a, in, even with a heater. So a heater in itself is not bad. It's just not doing the job as, as effectively. So the wintertime is tough and, and more and more people are just choosing to shut the waterfalls down and just use an aerator, you know, instead, you know, and that way it's simple. You don't have to worry about pumps and lines freezing and all that stuff. All the ponds you see around here run exactly the same way all winter long. You know, so we're able, we have some certain parameters and we've designed them enough that, uh, that we get, worked out all the, uh, all the kinks in the system, if you will. So cool. Awesome. All right. Um, so that's it about fish. Does anybody else have any questions about fish and that? Yeah. Yeah. Snails. Yep. I don't know why anybody would ever put a snail on their pond. <laughs> uh, that's my orientation. No, um, snails are cool. You know, I like all kinds of wildlife, um, but I've seen too many issues with snails. Um, that's why we don't sell them. Um, snails can be a good thing. I mean, they can crawl around the surface and they look cool. And there's nothing better than, you know, watching, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, little kids out there crawling around my pond at home. You know, when my kids were going up every birthday party, they'd be finding snails and frogs and all kinds of stuff. That's awesome. Um, but I don't recommend actually adding them if they're not coming because I've seen too many situations where snails will just colonize and just take over a pump and then they get into a pump intake and then they'll destroy a pump. Um, you know, so I, so it's one of these things like snails are kind of cool, but I don't want to destroy my pump, you know, so, so that's my biggest issue about snails. Other than that, I don't think they're bad, you know, um, uh, and if they're there, you know, I wouldn't do anything dramatic to get rid of them, but just pay attention to your pump you know, make sure they're not colonizing that way. But bottom line is, you know, when we talk about nitrates and we talk about removing nutrients, so you have less string algae, 
Um, stringy algae doesn't care what type of nutrient it is. Um, like for example, this particular plant here, there's a certain nutrient that produces that beautiful pink color. Um, there's another nutrient in there that produces that leaf. Um, this is society garlic. So if you ever break the stem off there, you can smell it smells like garlic. That's a certain nutrient that it's removing from the pond to be able to produce that characteristic. Um, this purple flower, this white stripe on the leaf, you know, all of those characteristics are, are using up a different nutrient. Um, so without getting too much into the weeds about all of those, um, each one of these different characteristics pulls out a different nutrient. String algae will use up all of those different nutrients. So string algae doesn't care. So if we want to reduce stringy fuzzy algae, let's put a variety of plants in there. Something tall, something short. A round leaf is going to take out a different nutrient than, uh, than like a, a, an iris leaf or an acorus leaf. Um, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, spike rush is going to take out a different nutrient than the bloody dock. Um, so look at all the different nutrients that this guy needs to grow to do, to do all of that. Um, so, so the key to reducing that stringy fuzzy type algae is let's starve the algae by putting other plants in there that are going to use up those nutrients. Does that make sense? So, um, so people always say, well, I don't know what type of plants to put in my pond. It's like, put them all in, you know? Um, somebody was that, you asked uh, how many plants in, in the pond. Um, so understanding that that's the role that plants play in the pond is they suck out the, the nutrients. The next thing we're worried about is what does it look like? And so, you know, if you ask me to help you design um, plants to go in the pond, I'll go over to the plant tables and I'll just start grabbing different plants and we'll just start putting like groupings of plants together. And I'm like, you know what, that kind of looks good. You know, that's kind of a little arrangement. Um, so we have, you know, some different colors, different textures, different heights, different bloom times. Um, those, uh, those types of things, you know, will look good together. So maybe, maybe like these three guys would, would look good, you know, together. So we have a couple different variegated colors and different textures, things like that. So it looks good for us, but it's also, keep in mind, it's doing a job of, of filtration. It's filtering out those nitrates. Um, you know, so like this is a marsh marigold. So that's one of the first things to bloom in the pond. So this blooms about the same time as a forsythia, you know, usually. So I love having marsh marigold in there because that's pulling out those early season, you know, nutrients. And, but to pair that up, you know, with a, uh, with a purple cardinal flower. So this guy here is kind of getting done for the season. This guy here is just starting, you know, but that red to green contrast looks awesome. But imagine the nutrients that are being pulled away with the red versus, uh, versus the green leaf, the yellow flower versus the, the flower on the, on the cardinal flower. Um, so the, the amount of plants you put in your pond, pretty much just put them in, you know, until you can't see the fish anymore. You know, and you're like, all right, I have too many plants. Um, and that being said, there are aggressive plants out there. Were you asking about that? Or somebody was asking about uh, plants taking over. That was you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, plants taking over, you know. So um, we built a pond up in uh, Bowmansdale, gorgeous half acre pond, uh, clay lined pond. You know, so we don't, uh, we, no, most of our ponds are, are lined with liner. This happened to be a half acre pond. We've trucked in some clay um, and 10 acre property, all native plants. So very, very adamant about it. I actually brought an expert in on native meadows who did all the meadows. Um, I did just all kinds of research to make sure we had native plant communities planted the whole way around this pond. Um, and all told on that property is 150 different varieties of native plants that we'd seeded this whole thing up with. Um, and I told them, I said, never, ever, ever put lotus in this pond and never put cattails in this pond. Two years later, guess what they did? Oh, no. Cattails. Um, so cattails in three years took over the entire community around that entire pond. All that work that we did to, uh, to, to make sure we had all these native plant communities. And we were doing groupings like this of native plants. And we were like, you know, all right, putting 100 of these, 100 of these, 100 of these. And I'm going to see in two years which one's out competing which one. And it's going to look great. Um, well, cattails won. Um, and, so, and so what happens on a, on a cattail, I mean, once it gets in there, it's just grows so fast. It's just going to take out everything else. And now we have a monoculture of one plant the whole way around there. Now today we've since restored it um, and uh, gotten rid of the cattails. Took three years to get rid of cattails. Um, literally going in and painting each cattail leaf um, to get rid of that cattail and that plant and not destroy the remnants of what was left around it. Um, long story short, they did the same thing with Lotus. Lotus took over that pond. And I can tell you stories about that um, and, um, and that. But but you have to have to be careful. Um, make sure that uh, like this, a chorus is awesome for a medium pond. But if you were to put that in a small pond, it could take over, um, you know, a small pond. But in a large pond, that's an awesome plant. You know, it kind of has that cattail type look to it, um, but it's not as aggressive as, as a cattail. You'll notice that we don't have um, any major cats or regular cattails on our tables here. We have some minis 
and we have some tinies uh, and uh, and a lot of other a lot of other plants. Um, you know, so uh, in some ponds, you know, some uh, some things will take over, um, but just. Most of the ones on our plant tables there, you're going to read the, the tag, and the tag will give you information on medium pond, a large pond, it's an aggressive grower, you know, it's well-behaved, you know, those types of things. But uh, for the most part, um, you know, on the, uh, on the lilies, um, you'll see, you know, the same thing there as well. Uh, but for the most part, you know, if you're doing a grouping of plants, you're doing three plants in a group, you know, you're going to find that that is a pretty effective uh, way to keep everybody under control, that you're not getting a monoculture of uh, a plant. So if you look on our plant tags, um, you'll see a couple different things. You'll see a pretty picture on there, and then you're going to see a QR code on here. Everybody knows what a QR code is. If you take your iPhone and, uh, and point it at that, it'll take you to our website. And our website, um, some of the plants have videos. Uh, some just have the information, you know, up there, but it's going to give you a little bit more information about it. Um, but it does right on the tag, it'll tell you the, uh, the depth. Um, of, of, what to, of what to put it in. Um, so all of our plants on our plant tables will grow just like that in your pond. So two inches of water is, it would be fine for all of those plants. Some of them can go you know, a foot, some can go three feet, uh, but, uh, but each, each plant will have that right on the, uh, right on the tag you know, that way. Um, but, uh, but again, varieties are, are best. You know? So plant some shallow water, plant some, plant some deep water, plant some lilies down, uh, down in there. So cool. What other questions? Winter time with the plants. Yeah, so back in the 1970s, there was a Better Homes and Gardens article that said you had to raise and lower your lilies. Um, if you look at my ponds, my lilies are planted in plant pockets. I've never raised or lowered a lily. Um, they're hardy plants, they will come back. Um, even plants in my stream, you know, if, if it's hardy you know, to this area, it'll come back. If you notice on our plant tags on the tables, let me see, and I picked all hardy plants here. Um, so. Um, most of our plants over there have, the, have a blue uh, color to code to them. The uh, tropical have an orange. Jenny? They have an orange? Yeah, so the tropicals have an orange uh, colored coat on them. So that's how you know whether it's a hardy plant or a tropical plant. Tropical just means it won't survive under 32 degrees, and so you just replace it every year, treat it as an annual, you know, that way. But if, it's, if it has a blue tag on it, it will come back year after year, and you don't have to worry about raising, lowering, anything like that. As far as um, repotting plants and things like that, um, what I like to do is we actually get rid of the pots in most of our ponds. Um, we'll, we'll create a little plant pocket. So it's a little indentation in the rubber liner underneath there, and then we get rid of the pot. We tow it, take it entirely out of the, uh, and this would be a good one, I'll just demo for you. <clears throat> we take it entirely out of, the, uh, out of the pot and just plant it right down in the, uh, yes, yeah, so you can see that one's all outgrown. So this is your uh, best tool ever, the soil knife. Um, it'll cut a pot, it'll cut roots. So. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, yeah, A.M. A. Leonard, great uh, garden, your gardening, uh, gardening supply website, you know, that way. But uh, um, so, yeah, so, and we'll kick, cover two birds here with one stone, but yeah, so that'll cut right through. And this is a narrow leaf cattail. So it's a less aggressive cattail, but you can see even this guy's pretty tough. <clears throat> nope, so I would, you know, in the right size pond, like in your pond probably wouldn't do this. Um, it would have to be bigger, you know, bigger than that. Um, but if we wanted to propagate this, there you go. Now I got two plants, I could cut that in half again. So not very, not very difficult to propagate, you know, something, uh, something like this. Um, but in a typical pond, let's say we're going to plant this marsh marigold, you know, down in there. I would just take it out of the pot just like that and then just kind of smush it down on the rubber liner just like that. Oh, okay. And then just cover it with a little bit of gravel. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. Yep. Yep. And that's it. Um, you know, you'll get a little bit of this soil kind of, you know, if, it's, if the pond is full of water, you get a little bit of that floating up, you know, that way, but, uh, but that'll settle out, you know, pretty, uh, pretty quickly um, that way. We do the same thing with our lilies. Um, what is this, my lily here? And at this point, I'm just making a mess for somebody else to clean up, so. <laughs> yeah, what'd you say? <laughs> yeah, right? <clears throat> No, that's why any time I get in a conversation about, so what do you do for a living? I said, I play in the mud for a living. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
All right. So here you go. This is a uh, this is a third year lily. Most of our lilies in our tank are second year lilies. Um, we plant them out one year, we let them grow, uh, and then uh, and then they come out the third year. So this guy here, you can see, um, there's a couple different you know spots where the leaves are coming out of. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So I could break that into five different uh, five different lilies that way, and um, let me just kind of show you a little bit. <clears throat> And just try to rinse the uh, rinse the soil off. So you have to be a little more gentle with this guy than you do the uh, the cattail that we were playing with earlier. But in your pond, if these are planted right down in those plant pockets, you don't have to worry about repotting or anything like that. The uh, rhizomes will grow right underneath the gravel. All right. So, our, yeah, our, our po we use that uh, just that round Pocono gravel, um, and it does a it does a nice job. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here you can see, I rinsed all the soil off of it that way. There's this hard, you know, tuber in there. I'm going to carefully trim a piece of this off. So I'm right in here between, you know, between that crown and this crown. There you go. And so that's a brand new lily that I can repot up uh, and, uh, and that'll grow out really nicely. So I have two, I have a little growing crown here, a growing crown there, and a growing crown there. So one, one main one and two other ones. So this is a really great way to rejuvenate your lilies and things like that if you do keep them in pots. That way, our um, our potting soil is a nice, you know, nice uh, organic mix. So we would put it down back in the pot, you know, put this around it, regrow it, and then uh, some fertilizer tablets to keep it going, um, you know, that way. But if you were to uh, repot your lilies, that's that's basically the the process that way. If you just if you have them down in the pond itself and they're just growing right underneath the gravel. Um, you know, this rhizome is kind of growing out that way. All you have to do is just reach down to your hand and your soil knife just under the pond and just cut away, you know, that excess, you know, that way. So that way you can keep it contained, you know, into the size that, uh, that you want it, you know, that way. Most of the time when we're building ponds now, it's like we just have a tiny little shelf for that one lily. So he's allowed to grow everywhere he wants on that shelf, um, but uh, he doesn't really extend out from that shelf at all. So. But water lilies, uh, I always say 16 inches is the perfect depth. Um, but they'll go 12, they'll go 24. So this guy right here, if we were to plant this in the pond today, you know, the, if the water level is here, this leaf in about two days will extend up to the top. Yep, yep. So, yeah, then that's, uh, and, and, and so if it's a 24, you can see it's gonna take a little bit more energy to get up to the top. If it's at 12, yeah, it's kind of shallow. It doesn't have enough, you know, room down, down below there. So 16 is, is really perfect. Um, 36, it doesn't get warm enough down there, you know, early on, so. If you wanted to leave it in the pot, you know, we do a couple of different things, um, you know, cut the rim off, you know, so it's a little bit more low profile of a pot and then, you know, get a couple small rocks and put rocks around it, you know, create your own plant pocket like that. Um, it's my thing is if the pond is crystal clear, who wants to look at the pots, you know, and that, that's, that, you know, that's the thing. Um, but we have a lot of customers who, who do, they keep it in the pots and then, and then every year they'll, they'll bring it, have us bring the plants up. We'll divide them all like this and then we'll replant them. And then now they have a, a potted plant that they can give to a friend, you know, and, and that type of thing. So, so it, it, people do it both ways. So the question is on the biofilter, how do you plant them in the biofilter? Well, our, our medium biofilter and our large biofilter actually have a plant tray on the top. Um, so it's a tray that actually contains, you know, you can actually take that, take the plant out of the pot, put the plant right down in there, put some rock and gravel right in it. And that totally does a great job of hiding that edge of the, um, that edge of that uh, uh, the biofilter, so you don't see it at all. So, so yeah, even in the biofilters, take them out of the pot. Yeah, I think it's the roots have more access to the water flow if it's out if it's out of the pot. If you look at our, our small pond, um, you'll see uh, some of this forget me not, you know, in there. And so the forget me not. Look at the roots on that guy already, just coming out of the bottom of this. Um, and so yeah, so you can see how it's so so fibrous those roots. Um, we have it planted right in the top of that, and uh, and those roots are just growing, you know, right down in there. 
and they're doing an awesome job of just removing all those nitrates. So, you know, once a year, we'll go in there and just kind of pull that out. You know, with this type of root system, it's not too bad to play with. I mean, it tears pretty easy, um, you know, on it that way. Um, you know, some things are a little bit more aggressive, you know, like uh, we do have some uh, for a larger pond, uh, button bush. So this is a great, uh, a great shrub that you can plant in the, uh, in the pond. So on, so on a larger pond, you could actually plant this up to about a foot and a half of, uh, of water that way. Um, but it's a great, uh, great option. Uh, and then these cypress trees. So this is an awesome, uh, awesome option, you know, there as well, you know, to do, uh, to do a tree, you know, in the corner of the pond. When do we cut the plants back? So in my pond, I like things a little messy in the winter time. See, I like things messy. Um, but uh, um, so I leave things up, um, create some winter interest. So my pond has snow and ice on it, but my thalia is sticking up through just the brown leaves of the thalia is sticking way up. The birds kind of tend to use that stuff through the winter time. And then in the spring, I'll clean it up. Um, most of our customers are the opposite. They want it cleaned up in the fall. You know, yeah, get that net off of there, get the leaves cleaned up in the yard, cut everything back on the pond. Um, so when you cut them back, you know, you can see here, like this guy here, this was cut last year. This is this year's new growth coming up um, that way. But it's just a matter of just uh, if water level, you know, if water level's right here, you know, I just want to leave these guys sticking up right above water level. You know, so we'll just cut them back just like that. You know, and, uh, and so, so these tips are above, above water level. Yeah, I mean, by the time the leaf net goes up, those, those hyacinths and lettuce, I mean, they're tropical plants, so they're going to turn to mush pretty quickly. So, yeah, so let's, let's get them out of the ponds. Yeah, and that's a great time to do it. Yeah, some people like to, oh, wait, it's still kind of warm out because we're putting the nets up in September. And then, you know, two weeks after we put the net up, it's like, yeah, you were right. We should have taken them out, you know, so, yeah.